cups to the fore and we <laughs> definitely are. <laughs> uh, and coffee to the right of me, but this Hangout on Air is live. I'm definitely with Robert, who has put in inverted commas in the centre of his GPAS profile there, Glass Explorer Warren. Um, thank you for joining us for the Glass um, Explorer or Glass interviews, um, Robert. Thanks for having me. Um, which part of this fair world are you currently geographically sitting in? I'm in a little town called Gallatin, which is about 30 miles north of Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee, fantastic. And um, on your Glass Explorer, um, sorry, your uh, G Plus profile there, I note that uh, you work in a, is it an educational context setting? I'm actually the director of technology for a career college, uh, so obviously, yes, it is a career college, but I don't do any of the instructional type uh, functions. I manage all of the IT infrastructure. And uh, do you see a, com a, you know, a compelling tie-in between that infrastructure and perhaps some of the systems that, that intersect with the learners and that of Glass? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I follow a lot of people that have uh, that are in the educational side. Like one, for example, is Dee Lanier. Uh, he's an instructor at a small college in uh, North Carolina, not college, but a K to K through twelve. And uh, he just recently got glass, and he's been kind of incorporating that into his uh, classroom structure. Uh, there's another glass explorer that lives in Atlanta. Uh, he actually instructs, I believe, at Kennesaw, and uh, he is in adult learning, so he tries to incorporate Glass into that. Um, we have implemented a Chromebook one-to-one uh, -one program for some of our students uh, in the Allied Health programs, um, but I see a lot of use in bringing, you know, lots of classrooms together in one place. You know, if you have a speaker, for example, something like this. If this were an interview that I wanted everyone to see, they could all tune in no matter where they're at. And, you know, some of that functionality, I know with the whole change of them taking the video call out of glass, it's kind of changed that a little bit. Um, I personally do not use that feature a lot, so I don't know how adversely it's affecting those who did in that kind of environment, but uh, I definitely see a lot of potential there. Uh, you mentioned there, um, I, I almost overheard you say, did you say glass room? Um, I was talking with Kathy Schrock this morning um, regarding her take on um, glass essentially in middle primary, um, uh, connected to multiple people, connected to the educator who potentially could be virtually el uh, elsewhere. Is that is that a likely scenario to develop, do you think? I, I absolutely think it is. Um, I, I don't see why that can't be um, a great functionality. One of the in the very very beginning of Glass, one of the really cool videos I watched, and I can't remember who published it, but he is a physics teacher. He does a lot of virtual instruction, and he wanted to take um, his classroom on a tour of CERN Laboratory in Switzerland. So he went out there with Glass and did a tour, talked with the people there that worked at CERN. Um, the class was watching with a hangout on air through his glass. They were asking him questions. He was relaying the question to them. And it was a really cool interaction. And they had cameras watching the students, and the students were, were just enthralled with what they were seeing because it's almost like they were there. Uh, that, that kind of interaction, you just, you just can't get that. Without with anything else, I just I don't see how that's uh, even possible, and it's just, it just opens up so many things for education. I think definitely the individual's name was Andrew Van den Heuvel. He's one of the people I interviewed fairly early on, actually. Um, oh, yes. Uh, while while speaking with Andrew, uh, he also mentioned uh, it wasn't cynically. He he brought up quite critically that he felt that he was he needed to withdraw as such or pull back away from the the glass side of things because he felt that you know Google in, in fact was had been kind of utilizing him as a marketing tool which we know um, the explorers are representing a, a product as such and an innovation 
What's your take on that? Have you had any reservations about you know, you know, Google using your IP or anything like that? No, no, I haven't had any reservation at all. It's one of those things you you kind of know what you're getting into when you get into it. I mean, if you don't, you you haven't you don't really know what you're getting into to begin with. So if, why are you even doing it? Um, sure, sure. I'm one of those people that I, I don't. Privacy is such a <laughs> it's such a hot topic. I think it always will. Um, I just don't. To me, what Google offers as services, it benefits me and it makes my daily life easier. So there's a trade-off in that. You know, 99% of what Google gives you is all free. So they have to make money somewhere. And yes, they have a huge revenue through you know their search engine, which is their primary source. But that search engine can be really targeted to what I want, you know, and what others want based on my interaction with it. So I'm going to let it have certain pieces of information that makes my life easier, and it does. I love Google Now, the Google Now cards in glass. Um, it gives you very relative contextual information that you just can't get if you don't have that kind of information going out. It doesn't come back in. So your, your participation in that in that context has been. Um, I noticed there that you say you're an early adopter, um, adapter, and and that you champion stuff and and enjoy that. Um, that point you're raising there about Google being, you know, giving you a lot in in the trade-off for information there. Um, I'm just wondering how. How does that play out, do you think, um, in kind of narrowing down what people can utilize in the future? I mean, have you had any contact with people who are competing with glass, like glass competitors at all? No, I haven't. Um, you know, you see things pop up here and there and, uh, you know, companies doing this or company doing that. It, it's it's kind of like the, the smartwatch industry. I mean, um, you know, I have a Pebble. I just recently got it, and you know, I love it. It's 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 really what I wanted. It's simple. It's easy to to deal with, to look at. It lasts a long time. But you have other companies that are trying to bring things to market. Of course, I know now with the Moto uh, 360, you have the LG Watch. Those are going to be some serious contenders that are going to work very well. But yeah. I think Pebble did it right, right out of the gate. I think Google has done this right, right out of the gate. Yes, it's still a beta. You're going to have other people following their lead only because yeah. they started the, the, the trend. And I think their design is pretty right on. I mean, they put a lot of thought into how they wanted it to function and really be a part of your life and enhance it. You know, like you see my prescription lenses. These are um, the lenses that are from Rochester Optical that they actually yep. clip on into the center. So mm -hmm. I wear glass every day. I don't. I usually don't take it off until I am ready to go to bed. Yeah, um, I can see I that. Regular pair of glasses that I'll use, but it just... Oh, that, was, that, that was my next question was, um, do you ever take the things off? Because I can see from, from your... Um, um, from actually some of your through glass... Um, they're quite creative and funny, witty. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> a juxtaposition between what the camera sees and what you've put in there. I don't know. What do they call that? The vignette, is it? The yes. Little, uh, yeah, a vignette. <laughs> like the one in there, what is it? Um, there's a truck with two flags and a tank on its side or something on its side that you've got on there. I shit you not. <laughs> it's like a... <laughs> Oh, yes. That was actually a power speedboat that was mounted on its side on a trailer. Uh, no, it's ridiculous. The other one that really, <laughs> the other one that really got me was um, oh, I'm looking here at your photos. It was it was a while back. Oh yes, I don't always post birthdays, but when I do, it's going to spam your feed. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I kind of like that because it's playing. It's um, playing with the tautology. It's playing with. It's kind of. Um, it's a good creative way of of diffusing what people would otherwise call glass hole activity. You know what I mean? Like, uh, look, there's people. I mean, if I look through your feed, your visual photo feed of through glass, I can see a billion people in there. But I, I can guarantee you, you didn't ask their permission to take the photo. You know what right. I mean? So it's normalizing, but at the same time, there's a human side to what you're doing in there. You know, you've got kids in there in your car. You got I can I can see into your whole life. So do you think through glass is really a, the most powerful part of glass, or what's the most powerful part for you? Well, you you see the part of my life I want you to see. That's right. That's the That's thing. Right. It's That's completely right. controllable, and if I don't want you to see it, you're not going to see it. Um, that's the thing about this whole platform, uh, Google in general, Google Plus, they give you control over how and where your stuff is being publicly sent. Um, and I choose in certain environments to invite people into my life. Sometimes like I say my life is silly. Like, I mean, I'm sure if you go through my feed, you'll see that, uh, I, I go to Sonic a lot. <laughs> you know, we like Sonic yeah. drinks. So, you know, I got to a point where I thought, well, people don't want to see this anymore. And I was hanging out with uh, Peter McDermott. I don't know if you've interviewed him, but uh, he's a glass explorer. He recently moved to, to uh, Texas. But yeah. we used to do a lot of um, hanging out in real life, and, and we'd hang out in Nashville. And, and he said, Robert, people love your, your Sonic posts. For whatever reason, it's just you. It's it's just you being you. And I'm like, you know, you're right. So hmm. after we had that conversation, I started posting every Sonic visit that I could post. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you what, some of my Sonic posts had more interaction on them than anything, which is, is silly, but it's funny. You know, it's just fun. Yeah, it's fun. So there's a fun side to this, and there's also a very serious side to this, because in a community uh, professional or other context, you're wearing a smartphone on your head. It looks different. People's perception of you is different. And in some cases, people have a lot of fear about what that thing is. They still don't know what it is or what it's capable of. Um, I don't need to ask you whether you've experienced bad or good. I'm sure you've experienced everything and predominantly good. That's why I'd be interviewing you. But the most important thing for me is what sort of impact do you think this is going to have in the long term on our community? Wow, that's a pretty wide open question. Um, well, on humanity maybe. Yeah, um, it, it's... I think... It brings me back to a, a, a something somebody told me one time. And they said, you know, because you always talk about how there's so much crud on the internet. And they said that it gives you back what you put in. If you put crud in, it's going to give you crud out. And yeah. I think that's the way it is with, with this technology, with any technology. It's how you use it. I'm a respectful person. So, like you say, oh, I see, you know, there's kids, there's people. But you know what? When you go to a baseball game and you take your cannon and you're taking pictures, people don't think twice about it. There's millions of people in those pictures. That's right. And I had one gentleman one time on one of my posts, he kind of got after me about, you know, hey, if my kid was there, you know, I wouldn't want you. And I, I was like, that doesn't make sense because you're in a public environment. I don't go into your house and take pictures of you. You're at the grocery store. You're in a parking lot. There's an expectation of privacy. I've mm -hmm. got people taking pictures of me, you know, because I have glass without my permission because they're like, oh, mm -hmm. look at that. I take a picture of him. I don't care, you know. Uh, there's no telling how many pictures I'm in across the world. I mean, who knows? But it's it really depends on anything that you can get your hands on. If you choose to use it in a negative manner, that's going to happen. Yeah. So how it impacts society, I think, is actually going to be in a positive manner in that you're going to have people think, well, I better be careful because – Somebody might be watching what I'm doing. I better not steal this, or I better not break that, or you know, whatever the case may be. That's that's my take on it. I, I might be a little naive to think that you know people are going to be concerned about that, but um, 
I think they will. I haven't I, had hmm. I've had one slightly negative instance at a concert. Hmm. They asked me to not use my Google Glass during the concert. And my question to him was, well, can I use my phone to take pictures and video? He says, oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm like, you just totally contradicted what you're saying because do you realize it's the same thing? And yeah. his statement was, I don't know anything about glass. And I'm like, that's why I wear it because I want to educate people to understand it's just simply the same thing as your phone or the Canon or the, you know, yep. Nikon that you're carrying around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But far more capable in being that it's always there. And as you said, you hardly take the thing off. Yes. Yeah. So there is, there is a key difference between the phone. You put it in your pocket, but you don't have it up next to your eye all day. Uh, and it's interesting. I'm just interested to know, you know how long people wear it. Some people say... The first thing I used to do was wake up, get up, hang my feet over the end of the bed and have a cigarette. I said, okay, well, that's up to you. You know, not, you know, it defeats me why you'd be smoking and breathing at the same time. But <laughs> some people are saying, I hang the bed, feet over the end of the bed and I put glass on. I go about my daily life and I come home and I put glass off and that's how often I wear it. Okay, well, that's... Yeah, and other people say, no, no, I only use it as a tool in a trap, you know, in a confined controlled setting for a specific professional purpose. So everybody's different. Everybody's different. And um, as a testament to this idea that you were saying there that people um, uh, people may be watching you and you know and so on, I've got in there, uh, Robert hasn't shared anything with you yet. People are more likely to share with you if you add them to your circles. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, yes. <laughs> that, that also amongst all of this, the only reason I can see stuff is because you shared it with me. Um, right. And um, maybe the expectation when we take the photo with the Canon, there's no expectation that it's going to be shared. But of course it can be. Um, and uh, yeah, all I'm pointing out here is there's people have different perceptions and differences with this. Um, I'm wondering, Robert, do you have any really profound use cases you think you would like to see appear um, or be developed for glass? Um, I really think the the video functionality that they took away is something yep. they really need to work on and bring back. Um, well, perhaps they are. <laughs> I, I would hope so. Um, that has a lot, a lot of potential to me in, you know, things I think of is... Like, for example, if my mother were still alive, I would be able to share events with her and have her, like, she's actually being there. And, and it brings me back when she, when my sister got married, okay? I didn't have glass, and this is several years back. But in that same environment, if I would have had Google Glass, she could have been a part of that wedding sitting at home. Now, we did try to bring her in because we set a laptop up with a webcam and... You know, she yeah. was kind of watching because she was not well enough to travel. So she did get to be a part of it in, in some respect, but not really the one-on-one -on -one kind of interaction that Glass brings to it. And yeah. I think that kind of functionality can add so much to one person's life within their family unit in showing, hey, let's, let's take so-and-so that's way over here that's not healthy enough to travel, and let's let them view this. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember her first name is escaping me last name is Hill she does a lot of things with veterans and she started this movement where um, you would go and you would you would look you'd see a monument or you know you'd bring a veteran to a place where they've been and show them what it's like now and kind of bring that interaction back into their life because they can't travel mm -hmm. um, and that's huge. They loved it. Without mm -hmm. the video function, I can record the video, but without having it live like that, you just kind of miss out. So I, I really hope they bring that back. That's that's going to be huge. I think that use case you just provided there would apply um, in many, many other different contexts. Um, and it's a powerful one. Uh, it means that, there's a, that that person is omnipresent 
um, connected and essentially they have become you or you have become them. You know, you're connected in that space and, and um, time. Um, Robert, in conclusion, I'm wondering if you could paint a picture for uh, your Australasian colleagues <coughs> who are in the same sorts of profession you are, who are part of infrastructural responsibilities for educational um, connection. Um, what do you envisage people who even, let's just picture it as being the actual learning management provider. What do they need to do to get up to speed in order to um, understand this, this onset, this new phenomena of glass? What do, what do these infrastructural providers now need to do? Well, it's it's going to have to really start on the development side of things to where the the app base is going to have to be much larger than it is now to make it functional in so many different kinds of scenarios. Um, the the way glass can be utilized is really left up to your imagination as to how you want it to work because. There's so many different things that you can allow it to do, but it's going to take a lot of development, not necessarily just in glass, but on the other end to where it all is seamlessly works. Um, there's videos out there I've seen where companies are using it out in the field to manage their equipment. Uh, there's another glass explorer that's building an app to where he can monitor his server performance right in glass. It brings up information right in the prism. Um, yep. Like for me, that would be huge because I manage servers from afar. Um, okay, well on that on on that point, on that point of servers from afar, distance education, all of that. That's what I'm talking about. Um, if say a, an app enabled um, a glass wearer to be able to cast their point of first person expert point of view doing something, a task, something that, that's proving something for assessment and that could be put into the, that could in some way be automatically put in, automatically put into the school servers which then is part of the learning management system which can then be evaluated for assessment. Um, is that scenario far-fetched? No, I don't think so. Um, I see exactly what you're saying. It, it, it's almost like you would make what you did as part of the curriculum where they're actually studying your hands-on using glass and, mm. and that's just another side of the tool I mean it's that's that's not far-fetched at all I don't think so but you're gonna again you just you're gonna have to have the development on both ends of the spectrum you're gonna have to have it in glass and you're gonna have to have it on the other side where it works together that's that's one of the things that a lot of people are working on now that glass is getting more and more popular is you're starting to see things you know pop up some of it you have to you know side load because it's not an official app yep. but it makes it very functional so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's just gonna take a kind of a consortium of people getting together and, and making it all work like it's supposed to work well believe it or not I think there's a great deal of industry collaboration and opportunity in that environment. I'm not seeing it happen yet, except we're taking a bit of a lead here in Australia by introducing a sponsor being Instructure, which is, is actually a, an American uh, incorporated company, um, looking at, yeah, the connection between glass and class, and class being distributed, aggregated, and whatever. That interaction, that information in some way being captured from the first person perspective that's being all um, being made available to assessors who are also aggregated in all sorts of different environments across different campuses and regions and counties and so on and in the middle is an intelligent system that makes meaning for the learner and also connects the educator and those those um, connections together so um, thank you for semi-validating my scenario. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, it's really wide open, and it's yeah. it's just where the imagination takes you. I think is is what its limit is. Um, 
it's just going to take some time for development. I think once it gets out into the public and people can buy it readily and it's it's a little more affordable, you're going to see an explosion of things and uh, it's the uses are going to be like, wow, I didn't realize it could do that, you know. But there's so many sensors in glass that you know people don't even realize what it detects, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just um, you're just tapping the surface, and eventually it's going to get smaller, more powerful, batteries be better. Whether whether that's going to be better for us, we don't know yet. That's part of part of my questioning of these of these interviews, is to know what the impact will be. Robert, thank you very much for joining me uh, as part of these class interviews. Um, all all of the interviewees will be invited to our May 12 event happening here at the Inspire Center at the University of Canberra, which is looking critically, uh, positively, proactively at uh, these, uh, this, this, this technological innovation. And um, I, I would welcome your input, uh, both in the asynchronous capacity that we're introducing and letting people access to, but also into the, the physical event, which is a virtual physical connection sure. uh, using infrastructures you're very familiar with, no doubt, as well. So uh, thank you for your through glass um, um, humorous um, um, uh, vignettes, and I look forward to many more. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Robert. Speak yep. to you soon. Yep, thanks for having me.